Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, thank Drega for sponsoring this symposium, and particularly Leslie Yoren for giving me the pleasure of sharing with you today a few thoughts on electrical impedance tomography. And what I would like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is explore three questions. Is why are we interested in electrical impedance tomography? How can EIT generate an image? And what are the clinical applications? And I'm trying to go give you some examples of the most common clinical applications where EIT might be used. And um, EIT has been invented in the 1980s, so it's not a new technique. Has been um, took about 30 years of uh, technological development and research to bring this technique to the bedside. But we can see that there's a growing interest in EIT, and that it can be seen by the number of publications that are uh, published every year in clinical journal, not engineering journal, uh, about lung EIT and uh, mechanical ventilation. And this has been started by the, the end of 1990s, where we realized that uh, mechanical ventilation can have an impact on lung injury, it can actually um, uh, add to lung injury that is um, the, the, the primary hit model. And then later on, we know that actually we can prevent, perhaps, by appropriately setting the ventilator or minimise ventilator-induced lung injury, and therefore this parallel increase in publications about EIT and lung protective ventilation. But what is the link between lung protective ventilation and EIT? Well, we know that um, Lung protective ventilation requires setting an optimal uh, ventilation for physiologically diverse lung regions. And also, we have seen how indices of global lung mechanics, and Salvatore has presented some very eloquent data showing that actually there are inadequate surrogates. And we need to understand a little bit more about the behavior of the lung at regional level. And therefore, we need real-time continuous monitoring tool, and we need something that um, will uh, avoid the disadvantages of traditional imaging techniques, such as CT scan, although they are very valuable. And therefore, EIT seems to fit almost the ideal uh, monitoring tool to guide ventilation. It is non-invasive, it is radiation-free, we can repeat it. Uh, it is continuous and also fast. It's got very fast responsiveness, and this is very important when we want to monitor and modify uh, therapy based on physiological response. But it's more importantly, is there, is at the bedside, is where we need to make clinical decisions. So I thought, how do we generate, how can the EIT generate an image and what, what it is an EIT image? So first of all, we can say that the image that EIT generates indicates a distribution of electrical resistivity or impedance. So I'm going to use the concept of resistivity and impedance uh, as the same way. An impedance for lung EIT actually is proportional to lung volume, is the amount of air that there is in the lung that uh, uh, stops the electricity going through. And we can measure that non-invasively with a rubber band, 16 electrodes around the chest, and what we can see that each of these electrodes around the chest will have a significant uh, contribution in the generation, the generation of the image. So they will have uh, two pairs, well, one pair of electrodes injecting some current, whereas all the other 13 pairs of passive electrodes will record a difference in potential in different areas of the lung. And when the first recording is done, then the next adjacent uh, pairs of electrodes will inject, and all the other passive um, electrodes will um, record the image. Now, this image, uh, as we we can see is done many times um, and the whole cycle of the EIT is when all the 13 pairs have injected and recorded and this happens very fast, happens in 50 times a second. It's much more fast and uh, responsive than any other technique and this is very well suited to sort of uh, uh, finding um, diagnostic or changes in physiology. So once we have all the um, resistivity measurements uh, performed, then what we can do is, what the EIT does, it will create a 32 by 32 matrix. What it means is the whole lung field is divided into pixels, 
and each pixel will have, any, will have a, a value of resistivity, which will correspond to a value of lung volume in that particular area of the lung. And then the EIT will, uh, through mathematical softwares, will generate an image. And you can see that images are scaled uh, either as a sort of color scale or as a monochromatic scale um, to indicate change in resistivity uh, from no change to maximal change. So we can identify where this change in resistivity and therefore volume happen within the lung. Now, this, despite the fact it's a very fast responsiveness, the temporal, sorry, the anatomical resolution, therefore the spatial resolution, is not very good, is very poor. But that is not necessarily a, a bad point about the EAT. We need to recognize that limitation because it's not a substitute, for example, for CT. It's not an anatomical technique. Um, and that will depend on the number of the electrodes, depends on the size of the chest, there is some individual patients, and depends where in the chest we want to find the resolution. So the resolution tends to be better at the periphery, near the electrodes, and a little bit wider at the center of the image. That's not a lung, by the way, so we, as we know. <laughs> and, um, the other thing is that the slides that the EAT provides is not the slides that we are used to in terms of <laughs> CT scan. X-ray travel in a linear fashion, uh, whereas electricity doesn't, is non-linear. So therefore we can have a, um, a big band or a big slice of the EIT, which will depend on the size of the patient, but it's between 7 and 10 centimeters across the band. So that's what the image is, a thick slice that the EIT can image. But we're talking about image, and what is it, this image, precisely? You can see that on the, your left-hand side, this is a dynamic image of an EAT uh, during tidal ventilation, and this is a waveform of the changes in impedance over time. And if you can take these e impedance images, you can superimpose them to a volume uh, waveform, it will look exactly the same. And what the EIT does will calculate changes in impedance over time, and it will uh, create some different tomograms from the maximum um, resistivity, which corresponds to uh, inspiration, to the minimum resistivity, which is the end of expiration. And then it will subtract these two images to create what is called a tidal imaging. So that is the sum of the volume changes that happens in the lung during a tidal breath. But the, the EAT, what, 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 the, the changes in impedance are linearly related to tidal volumes or volume changes. And we can see that we can calculate two clinically relevant changes in volume. If you can see here on your left hand side, one is the change in impedance due to tidal volume or tidal ventilation. And this will correspond to changes in volume for each breath. So these are compressed over time, which will correspond to tidal volume. And they're called tidal variations because we can't really assign a volume, a precise volume for a region of the lung at the moment with um, this type of uh, technique. But also we can find out and expiratory lung volume. So this is very important, for example, during a recruitment maneuver. And this is what I try to illustrate here on your left hand side. So this is a change in PEEP, PEEP from zero uh, to 20 and down to zero. And you can see that we have tidal variation and we have an end expiratory lung volume. So that's the uh, volume of the lung at PEEP of, uh, of five, uh, that is before, before recruitment. And after recruitment, we have a change in end expiratory lung volume, which we can quantify in relation to the tidal variation, and will give us an idea whether a patient is, that area has been recruitable or not recruitable. And we can have that at the regional level. So this is a chest X-ray, of course, and you can see that here we have the tidal impedance on the right lung and on the left lung, and it's quite clear that the right lung is less ventilated than the left. And we compare it to CT scan at the regional level, we can see that the right uh, ventral region is less than ventilated than the left. And again, the right dorsal, is all, is, there is no ventilation going on that side compared to the left dorsal. 
So if we go to the clinical application, there are a variety of clinical applications. Um, I'm going to give you just brief examples, just for sake of time, and some of them are to do with evaluation of therapeutic interventions, physiotherapy, for example, detection of pneumothorax, intubation or pleural effusions. Um, we want to know regional behavior of the lung. We want to know what part of the lung is, uh, where the gas is distributed, the lung mechanics at regional level. We want to know whether a region of the lung is recruitable, where it's collapsing or hyperinflated. We want to know whether we can set the optimal PEEP based on that. And finally, but we probably won't have time to go through here, but it's pulmonary blood flow. This is a very new avenue of research in EIT. Let's see whether we can match ventilation with uh, perfusion of the lung. So if we can start with some images now, um, the, this is a study just to show how EIT could guide simple things such as intubation or, for example, the uh, insertion of a double lumen tube. And you can see here, this is the lung uh, tube correctly uh, placed. We have ventilation on the right and the left, and the image is symmetrical on both sides. This is a either a misplaced tube or a correctly placed double lumen tube on the left, and we can see we can perfectly isolate the left from the right and then vice versa. This can be an important uh, uh, monitoring tool during, for example, a, uh, procedures. Also, we can detect real-time pneumothoraces, for example. This is a pig study, um, and this is a CT scan. You can see an EIT image showing the tidal ventilation of that lung. But also, you can see here there is a small pneumothorax, so 100 milliliters of air has been inserted in the pleural space. And you can see now, I don't know whether you can see it well, but there is an area that is missing there in ventilation. And if we subtract this image from this image, what we can see is the quantification of a pneumothorax. This can be done real time and has, in this study, 100% sensitivity in detecting a pneumothorax as small as 20 milliliters. And you can see that if we um, apply this technique, for example, during a procedure where there is high risk of a pneumothorax, central line insertion, or recruitment maneuver, then we can have a continuous feedback to uh, highlight the presence of a, of a pneumothorax. Then positioning. We've discussed about prone position. Um, uh, Pratik was mentioning prone position earlier on. And obviously, this is a quite clear that we can see a change in distribution of ventilation, which is what we expect. Um, from prone going to, towards the posterior ventilation and supine towards ventral, but it's not all, always happening. And um, some patients in prone position don't show that transition. So knowing which ones they do, which ones they don't, might be clinically relevant. I'm going to touch something very dear to um, 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 Nadia and Penny that will talk extensively later on this afternoon. But basically, this is distribution of ventilation using two types of mechanical ventilation settings, volume control and APRV. You can see here open circles are the ventral regions and closed circles are the dorsal regions. And you can see how in this mode of ventilation, all the ventilation is preferentially distributed in the ventral areas, whereas in APRV, at the beginning, they start with the same distribution and then completely reverse. The dorsal region are much more ventilated than the ventral one. So they can, they can alert us about ventilation. This is a recent patient that we have studied, and this is a patient where you can see here the EIT with pressure control, CPAP pressure support, and NAVA ventilation. What you can see on your left-hand side, the tidal volume or the tidal uh, images are pretty much the same. But what we can see is a complete change in the delay of ventilation of this lung. You can see the left lung is very delayed in, uh, in opening, whereas when it goes into spontaneous ventilation, you can see that now we have the reverse. Some of this blue area means they are opening early, and some of this, uh, in, in place of these red areas, that meant they were opening late. So it's a complete difference between mandatory and spontaneous ventilation. Um, regional behavior, very quickly. So this is one of our patients referred to a uh, severe respiratory failure center, and you can recognize this is the EIT, and there is a PEEP ladder 
peep um, recruitment maneuver, um, going up on the peep and down again. And what we can see that we can um, find out about um, optimal PEEP uh, levels by looking at compliance. This is static compliance for each level of PEEP going up. And we can find that as we go up, obviously we will have a point in the PEEP level where, which will correspond to maximum compliance. We can do the same thing with EIT. If we substitute the calculation of compliance instead of total volume, volume change in impedance, then we can also find what is the PEEP associated with a greater compliance. But what we have found is that there is, although the absolute difference is small, actually there is a greater variation in the PEEP associated with the best compliance in the EIT. And I'll show you later on why, because it takes into consideration regional changes. So when we think about um, studying the alveolar behavior, what I mean is that we have some regions that when we go up on the PEEP level, the compliance will improve, the local compliance will improve. And these are regions that are opening, okay? We have other regions again, like Salvatore shown some uh, photos, uh, some pictures later on, where the compliance, and this is I'm talking about local compliance, decreases. These are areas that are over distending. And when we go down on the PEEP level, then some of the areas, the compliance might improve. These are areas that were over distended and now they are recovering. And some of the areas instead they were recruited, now they will be collapsing. And now what we can do, we can put that in a map. And we can see that uh, going from PEEP 0, for example, to 30 and down to 0 again. And we can see which area opening, over distending, collapsing or recovering. And it's very clear that here be there is a transition between PEEP uh, 15 and 10 where we start having some collapse. And perhaps somewhere between 15 and 10 is probably the optimal PEEP. We can have some ventilation delay here. I'm not going to spend more time, but basically saying that we can tell us how uniform the lung is with a certain level of PEEP. Uh, here you've got lots of early ventilation and delayed, and here is more uniform. So it doesn't tell us just about volume, but about physiology and, and behavior of the lung. Now this is just an image of two patients, because I want to show you whether the EIT can differentiate between exactly what Salvatore was saying, which patients are um, for, uh, let's say, ECMO or, or a lung protect strategy, and which one we can increase the PEEP. So this is a 3D model uh, which we have created from CT, from two of our patients. And, um, just the areated lung. You can see at the posterior uh, dependent area, there is virtually no alveoli, but these look are pretty much the same, very similar. When we look at um, their CT, a bit like what Salvatore has shown, you can see that on your left hand side, here there is a lot of hyperinflation and there is collapse over there. Whereas in this patient, and these are similar patients, they have got no hyperinflation and potentially some lung collapse. So how can we differentiate between these two patients at the bedside? Well, we can have a look at the compliance as I've shown. This is static compliance in the patient on the left hand side and this is on the right side. You can see they look similar, but if you look at the EIT, they look opposite. This as we increase the PEEP, there will be over distension. And as we increase the PEEP on the right hand side, there will be recruitment. So we can see how we can differentiate at the bedside exactly what the CT scan is going to show us. And what we have done that in is about, in about 18 patients, we found that the, there is a median about one in three patients is either over distended, tidally over distended, or under recruited. And you can see the wide margin of, uh, of range is quite substantial. We can do that to the bedside as well. This is again is an, one of our, another of our patients. Again, a recruitment. And we can see here going from PEEP 30 to PEEP 5, you can see the tidal uh, changes in volume. But also you can here, see, I don't know whether you can read it, here says OD, which means over distended and collapsed. We can see here we've got 15% of the lung is um, uh, over distended here and zero is collapse 
collapsed and we can go all the way down until we find the place or peep where there is minimal over distension and minimal collapse. In this case, a peep of 20. This has been done in animal data and this is a very recent study which shows in a peak pig model using an EIT guided peep uh, setting versus an ARDSnet guided uh, peep setting. And you can see that there is much more collapse on the left hand side, there is more lung injury on the left hand side, but also you can see that with EIT guided, the peep is substantially higher, but the plateau is the same. We've got a much better uh, compliance of the dorsal areas, we've got much greater uh, sorry, um, uh, PF ratio, a much lower oxygenation index, meaning that uh, obviously this lung is more open. It is a pig study, but it's a proof of concept. So I'm just trying to make some time by giving a summary of what I've tried to say in the last 20 minutes. I think EIT is a really useful bedside tool to monitor lung volumes and lung physiology with some specific maps of lung physiology. We can identify PEEP and recruitment. It's got a good temporal resolution, but the anatomical resolution is, is inferior to CT scan, but that not the place that it has. And we can find regional analysis at the bedside. And with that, I conclude, and I thank you for your attention.